And, and what we wanted to do today was, was just kind of step back and look at this first principles idea. Uh, we wanted to put these basic principles of org design in, in two contexts. The first one is looking at the context of the world today. Um, a variety of things are happening now in the world uh, that are going to affect how organizations think about org design, and we wanted to sort of put the concepts and the frameworks that we've talked about over the years inside these, this, this new context. And we also wanted to acknowledge that organization design exists alongside organization development. So there's a, there's a process of design and redesign. There's the content of design. There's the process of redesign. There's a process of change. And, and we wanted to try and, and see if we could stitch those three things together. You know, sort of first principles, the basics of org design, looking at the context of the world as it is today, and, and then kind of the, the relationship between org design and organization development, organization change, change management. So I think that that's the theme that sort of runs through here. Um, again, as you know, as you know, those of you who know Sue and I, we, we keep trying to push ideas out, and uh, our, our sincere hope is that we've pulled all those three things uh, together in a, in a nice way. Uh, nice and coherent way that'll that'll make a lot of sense, and and so let's let's get started. Um, I I keep running into this term, VUCA world, and uh, and I'm pretty comfortable with the VUCA standing for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But I also run into people from time to time when I use to say, well, well, you live in a VUCA world, uh, you know, the hand will get raised, and what, what does VUCA mean? So it's 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 you know, that idea is becoming more and more popular, but it hasn't completely spread around either. Uh, the notion that the, the, the new reality, the new normal that we're in, um, is composed of these elements that are uh, volatile. They don't, they don't stay stable, right, uh, over periods of time. They're uncertain. I'm going to talk a lot about uncertainty here in the next couple of minutes. They're complex, meaning that there are multiple things going on. There's not just one change going on. There's multiple changes going on. And the meaning of those things, the, the, the cause and effect connections are ambiguous. It's, it's uh, making meaning out of uh, the complexity and the uncertainty is pretty difficult. Um, and that's kind of the context of, uh, of the world that we're living in. It used to be fairly simple. Uh, for those of you who have been through the design course already, I often show this slide and, 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 and suggest this is not a bad way to look at the, at the environment we're living in. There are social issues and technical issues and economic issues and ecological and political regulatory issues. And this is how we used to, you know, coach people uh, in organizations, coach executive teams to think about their environment. And, and we proposed a variety of fairly simple sounding questions, you know, uh, what is the, uh, you know, the millennial and LGBTQ uh, demographics, how is that affecting things uh, in your industry, how fast is technology changing? Uh, and we encourage you to, to, you know, map your environment according to these fairly standard uh, kinds of um, sources of uncertainty, but no less than the um, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve last week came out with their report after looking at the, the situation that they're in and whether they should be raising interest rates and how they're managing the fiscal policy of the United States. She came out, uh, Janet came out with this sentence, and, and the terms considerable uncertainty were spread across, the, across social media, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times here in Europe. Um, the, the words considerable uncertainty really sort of were popped out. And, and you know, an, or a group that is responsible for kind of keeping things relatively stable, uh, whew, to come out and say this is the, you know, this is the way we see things, that there is considerable uncertainty in the way this world is unfolding, I think is, a, is kind of a sign of the times. And, and as soon as I started thinking about what, what were those sources of uncertainty that uh, um, Federal Reserve might have to deal with? 
we kind of bucketed them into two. Uh, I don't think it's uh, it'd be a shock to anyone that we're looking at uh, this wave of populism in all of its different forms and its sources. Um, there's some things in the past in terms of the Arab Spring and Brexit and Trump's election. There's some things coming up over here in terms of the French elections, the sources of this being kind of the increasing uh, concentration of wealth and the, the disparities between the haves and the have-nots. And, and boy, people really starting to understand the power of this populist movement and, and, and the number and the masses of people that are, uh, that are arguing for, hey, you're, you're not paying attention to me. Um, you add that into the global uncertainty around terrorism and geopolitical issues, uh, wars, refugees, terrorist attacks, computer hackings, uh, is there global warming or isn't there, trade wars, and, and, and is the United States in an international leadership position or not anymore? Um, these things are, you know, those are, that, these things weren't on the list. Right of the traditional questions that you were supposed to ask about your environment, and of all the slides um, that I'm going to speak to, I think this one might be the crux of it, because as designers, we need to understand for any particular event or trend what's causing the uncertainty. Uh, part of it is, do we have access to the information that we need? And is that information any good? Uh, the whole notion about fake news and, and, and its use uh, to uh, try and scare people, to uh, ostensibly inform them. The sources of our information now are unclear. Who do we trust when we hear information about a trend? And, and, and is it actionable information? Um, we don't know. What the, what the cause and effect relationship is between things now because of the complexity. We might say it's important if we, if we change the objective in our organization and we increase our, our KPIs along financial, productivity, uh, human capital measures, and we increase those by 1%, are we going to get some kind of change inside the organization? Boy, we don't know because there's so many other things that could influence whether or not that change in a particular KPI is going to make a difference. We just don't know because of the complexity. Um, as I look at all of these uh, uh, different parts of the environment, and again, back to the complexity, each of the stakeholders that we're dealing with in the NGOs, the populist uh, uh, stakeholder groups, uh, the regulatory environment, government, uh, shareholders, each of these groups wants different things from the organization, and how do we satisfy all of those is going to contribute to our lack of understanding about what we should do and increase our uncertainty. Um, we don't know how long it will take uh, before we see some indicator that the changes we intended to make are having their intended outcomes. Uh, it could be instantaneous. It could happen faster than we expect, it could take a lot longer than we expect. Um, and so knowing not just cause and effect relationship, but how quickly a particular action is going to result in a, in a particular outcome is, is unknown. And across all the things that we might do, all the potential strategic initiatives, uh, design changes, strategy changes we might make, we just don't know which one of those is most likely to be the right one. And uh, because of the complexity, because of the uncertainty, it just makes it difficult. And, and it's in this context now that we have to start thinking about what structure should I have? What's the proper reward system? How do we make decisions uh, in the organization? We now have to sort of make choices about those things inside of that context. And so if you look at uh, organization design, it's in the middle of this vice this vice grip. Um, the environments uh, that we're talking about and the extent to which they uh, create uncertainty make it difficult for us to make choices about structures and processes. On the other hand, technology is changing, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, um, and, and the notion of how do we make things, how do we do things uh, is, is now completely changing. 
and, and increasing um, the amount of uncertainty that's going to happen in the work processes of our org design. So we've got some real, we've got some real challenges here in this new normal context um, and thinking about uh, how we might uh, make choices for, for design. Um, this is a slide that, that Sue and I have used before, and I tried to make some adjustments to it inside of this new, this new normal. Um, we think that uh, building a capability around org design will actually help us address some of these issues of uncertainty, because org design can help us think about whether our resources are uh, allocated in a dynamic way, or are they rigidly set? And so. Uh, we can design organizations that allocate resources, people, time, budget, um, uh, priorities. We can design an organization that's more flexible around those uh, resources and priorities, or we can set something up and says it's in place, it isn't going to change, you know, deal with it. Uh, we can design organizations that coordinate uh, functions, dimensions, uh, countries, products, customer sets. We can design organizations um, in a flexible and efficient way or an inflexible and inefficient way to, to think about how those resources are used or, or wasted. Um, we can think about quality, speed, and innovation and the extent to which those are enabled or disabled by our choices of work design. We can make work hard or easy for people. We can manage and design customer interfaces that are easy to use for our customers but we can make it really hard for our customers to do business with us. These are design problems um, that, that we've talked about over the years in our design courses. And in the context of all this uncertainty, I think there's, uh, there's some real opportunities here uh, for organizations that want to deal with that uncertainty better by thinking about org design. If we go, if we just kind of click over now and, and start thinking about um, I'm trying now stitch together this, this uncertain context, stitch it together with some of the change issues that we've been talking about. Um, and, and we've talked before about sort of two ways of looking at change. In the, in the old world, in the, in the old normal, we were very fortunate in that most of the time we could focus on efficiency. We could look at the world as relatively stable, and from time to time, uh, because of a disruption in technology or customer or life cycle changes, we were able to then go through a, a, a transformation. And so on the left, I've tried to you know, draw a picture of what that looked like. Things were relatively stable. We focused on efficiency. We, uh, we looked at total quality management, Six Sigma, uh, continuous improvements, and, and did our best to pull waste out of the system. And then at particular points in time, we had to go through a transformation, adjust our strategy, structures, uh, cultures, and, and put new systems in place. And the whole, the whole uh, flurry of activity was done as fast as we could so we could get back to some kind of normal, stable situation. Today, on the right-hand side, I think a different thing is happening. Um, our, our levels of change are a little higher. In other words, the base rate of change is a little higher, but we don't see the peaks. What we tend to see is a lot of change happening continuously, and that's kind of pushing organizations to think about design and change together, not as separate things, but as uh, the things that are kind of working together. Um, decision making is now getting pushed down. Uh, here, in, here in France, we've been working with uh, the power company, and as they think about technology change and, and how does that affect the organization, they understand that decisions are going to have to get pushed down farther in the organization. And that's a hard thing for a, for a culture in a country that looks at hierarchy as a really important part of the, the way they do work. So. This is a challenge to the way the French uh, organizations are working. And as Sue and I were kind of going over this slide, she reminded me, you know what, that, this picture is good, but it's incomplete, because it's not just that there is a, a particular change in the organization that's going on. 
um, the organization is actually going through, because of complexity, there are a couple of changes that are sort of happening at the same time. And it's not just one particular change or two particular changes. There may be three or four or maybe more relatively large strategic initiatives that are taking place in the organization. And is the organization capable of understanding how to coordinate all those changes? So making the, 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 the complete flip now over into the change management side of things, we have all these friends. I call them our old friends of change management, whether it's change acceleration, uh, traditional Lewinian unfreeze, change and refreeze model, the, the current po currently popular ADCAR processes and, and the notions that John Cotter has put forth uh, around change management. These are the friends. These are our friends. These are the things that we've become comfortable with. And if you look at them, each one of them is clearly married to the first way of doing change. Each of those models is, describes how change occurs on the left-hand side of this graph, not on the right-hand side of this graph. And so all of these models, built mostly in the 50s and the 60s, are still the way we tend to think about change in design or the redesign of organizations. Um, uh, we, we put a lot of stress on executive leadership. We say, why didn't the change, why wasn't the change successful? Well, leadership withdrew its support. Um, we spend all of our time worried about risk mitigation because change is the enemy, change is messy, and therefore we have to find ways to control change. We're going we're gonna to plan it. We're going to develop tools and scripts and playbooks that, that, that prevent, present the illusion that we're actually going to control this messy thing as it unfolds. And so we put Gantt charts and plans in place. And, and again, we try and present the illusion that uh, this messiness can all be controlled. And, and the truth of the matter is that's not, that's not a fair representation of what's actually going on. All those things are important, but uh, they, they tend to present a view of change that actually can be managed and controlled, and, and we know that's just not going to happen. Um, the, the change that's going on today is, in fact, really messy. Um, they assume change is going to be over, uh, you know, change, uh, unfreeze, change, and refreeze. And we, we implicitly are telling people that change will be over. And, and, and people are reacting to that now. They're, they're, they're feeling pretty angry at being sent a message that, uh, yes, if you achieve this goal, we won't bother you anymore. Um, and, and, and all of these change models seem to agree with that old model of, of transformation and not the new model of continuous change. Um, the complexity that we talked about requires that we actually do org design at all levels of the organization. Uh, it's not just a simple process of putting a new structure place or doing team building in a new unit or figuring out how to coordinate between two functions. It's all of those things put together um, and multiple changes having to take place at the same time. Those changes are not only happening in different parts uh, and happening at the same time, they're occurring at different levels of the organization. And again, uncertainty put on top of um, on top of hierarchical change and, and linear processes of change just result in a uh, ambiguous and complex uh, way of thinking about the world. So as Sue and I stepped back as we tried to you know think about this context, we started looking at the way organizations were designing and redesigning themselves. And we've proposed an alternative change model that we think integrates some of these ideas of org development and org design together. We suggested that the middle of the model was a process of engagement. You're in not, not the traditional idea of engagement, employee engagement. We mean intentionally thinking about being aware of what's going on inside and outside of the organization being intentionally aware of the different design options that you have and being intentional about understanding that any particular design option is going to have to be tailored 
and 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 because of the complexity, because of the uncertainty, you're going to have to monitor what goes on and learn fast about whether or not uh, the choices that you that you made are actually going to work. When you do that engagement and you engage in that stuff frequently, you get better at it and you begin to learn. Um, and, and you can do each one of these things better. But the real key here is the link, the link we've got now with organization design, that that designing part of that begins to say, is there a design-based way of thinking about organization development? And, and we think this model begins to answer that question in, in really important and profound ways. We've talked about how that might show up in agility and, and tried to, to think about how you build routines and capabilities that allow you to change. And Sue coined the term the routines of change that allow organizations to um, change as, 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 make change normal but at the base of it all was good management, and at the base of it all was our, our friend the star model and, and it providing us with the levers that we needed to make uh, the changes happen. So we think agility is a capability. Capability is a design problem. And, and we think that uh, mm -hmm. some of these issues around uh, uh, the star model and uh, the, the engage and learn model help us figure out how to approach and adjust and adapt to this uncertainty that we're feeling. Um, whether it's big changes like this or small changes, it really becomes an issue of how do we coordinate all those changes together to, to help an organization deal with the uncertainty that they're dealing with. And, and on that note, I'm going to flip it over to Sue and, and ask her to talk a little bit about how we have been working with organizations to think about building these uh, design capabilities. So, Sue, I'll, I'll hand it over to you and hope I've done a good job of, of getting you ready and setting you up right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I actually, I think we're coordinating, not being set up. But in any case, <laughs> uh, the slide you have on there right now, I just want to make a, a point about what, where I'm going to head. Um, <clears throat> What basically Chris has argued is that the organization is going to have to continuously develop new capabilities because the world around them is continuously changing. And the examples on this particular slide are, are twofold. They're things that um, many of you have been dealing with, but they, they really point out the point about capabilities, which is having a global product organization um, and entails changing the role of local organizations to be market-facing, and being able to articulate between what's global and what's, what's sort of the back end and, and common and what's the front end and tailored to the local organization. Many of you have been struggling with that and struggling with that um, for years, uh, particularly those of you who are in consumer products. Um, it's a capability that involved huge change in many of your organizations. And our argument is based on what Chris described about how the world is changing that that's going to be a very dynamic set of, cap of, um, of balancing routines between what's local and what's central, what's leveraged, and what has to be really responsive. And just as an example, the more we become uncertain about the role and the dominant role that historically the U.S. and the West has played in the global economy, uh, the more we're going to have to really reconsider what that balance looks like and how to be agile enough to go where the marketplace and the competitive dynamics are leading us. Um, and in addition to that, the political economy issues that we're facing in today's world. And we, we think that's just been ratcheted up. So this capability development is not just a capability, how do you connect a global product organization with the local markets, but it's a dynamic capability. How do you do that over and over and over and continuously, differently in India than in China, than in uh, South America, than in the U.S., for example? So um, capability development is, in our view, what design is all about. And uh, one of the big capabilities to develop is the capability to be agile enough to do that, uh, which is what we're here to talk about. And uh, this next slide just shows the criticality of designing in the, in the ongoing change capabilities that are on the left that allow you to, in, um, to adjust to the VUCA world. 
and um, the right-hand side, which is you've got a set of tools you can play with, and they are the design tools. That's what you can change in order to change people's behavior. And um, in order to do that, you have to have a really agile design capability. Hence, in, in you probably read what the, the introduction to this session that we sent out, hence we really started thinking about what needs to be internal in terms of the capability of the organization to uh, respond really agilely to a continuous flow of requirements to change large or small the design features of the organization. Could be very focused on a small element of the organization, could be pretty large, uh, restructuring um, to address a strategy change that's occasioned by uh, a very different set of market dynamics and or a competitive pre uh, presence that is really um, uh, disruptive to the industry. But it's going to be, in our view, pretty continuous. So uh, for the last 10 years, Chris and I have been looking um, in a pretty systematic way at what is design capability and how do organizations develop it. And we've had the, the good fortune to be able to work with um, about 13 organizations that have been trying in various ways um, to develop this capability. And some of you are on the phone, and we thank you for our partnership working together on this. And what, we're gonna, what I'm going to do is share a little bit about what we've learned about design capability. And we've been fairly um, um, perplexed by the fact that um, it hasn't been a capability that um, organizations have invested in. Um, it, it's been a capability that they've, Chris uses the word rented, uh, hire consultants to come in and help. But in, to, in, to some extent, that model of getting design capability by hiring consultants to come in and help and lead it and, and, and partner is, um, is much more amenable to the episodic view of change that we, we argue is now obsolete than to the ongoing uh, view of change that we argue is going to be um, uh, in, in place um, for the foreseeable future, um, if not the next several decades. Um, so what is designing organizations? It's a continual process is our argument of purposely configuring the elements of the organization to foster the achievement of a lot of different stakeholder outcomes, business, customer, employee, social, ecological outcomes. Um, but I think the major word there that we'd like you to focus on is it's continual. And in fact, you can make the argument, and it's one that we're seriously considering, um, is the case that the more you continually uh, adjust and adapt, the less you'll be um, having to deal with these large episodic changes where so many pieces of the organization have gotten out of sync with the environmental requirements that you really do need a major strategic restructuring. Um, the, the, our old friend, the STAR model, still continues to guide us. We get people writing in to us saying, why don't you get beyond that and realize that now we're in a networked world? Well, what is network? Network, network is structure. Network is process. Or now we're in a world where people have to be um, uh, inspired and that behavior comes from inspiration. And that's true. That's around people and around values in the organization. Um, our argument is that these are still your tools that you have uh, to adjust the way you apply your resources and the way you direct your people to deal with the issues that are most important to the organization being able to carry out its strategy and meet the, the uh, demands of the stakeholders. Um, so developing the capability to do that, to continually uh, continue adjust design um, and continually introduce change is in and of itself a capability that has to be developed. Hence our topic, which is how to develop design capability. And what we have found is that almost all capability development involves three buckets. One is the talent and knowledge that is required for the capability. And that's one that HR organizations and executive leadership in general have realized without that you actually can't accomplish the strategy or carry out the capabilities that are inherent in what you're trying to um, accomplish and the value you're trying to deliver in your environment. Um, a second piece of it is how do you configure all those resources? 
how do you make it so that you aren't just creating a colander where you get really talented people, you put them in roles, they get frustrated because their efforts go through the, the holes of the colander and are dissipated because the organization isn't designed well, and they leave. How do you do that? And how do you um, implement the many changes that need to be put in place and learn and continually improve. Uh, it's, there's a whole lot of research that says strategies don't get implemented because um, the organization doesn't spend enough uh, time and, and attention on putting in the design features and implementing them in order to carry that strategy out and to develop the capabilities that are inherent. So we think this is a pretty big deal for organizations going forward. Um, and we've al also picked up that there's a lot of stress in organizations around the pressures involved in uh, developing this kind of capability and actually making the changes that are needed to be made. So if we look at what's required in these three buckets to develop design capability, any capability, but here we're going to talk about design capability, um, for talent and knowledge, that creating a critical mass of design and change-related skills and knowledge. And again, we think organizations are really going to have to think, what of that do we rent and what of that do we develop somehow embed in our organizational capabilities so that we can make those ongoing continuous changes that are required in today's environment without having to declare we have a big initiative underway. Um, for in, in implementing and learning, uh, we believe that organizations are going to have to really up their capabilities to get people engaged in changes in a very efficient and quick manner and learn from the changes so that the learning stays in the organization. It doesn't leave when external people leave the organization. And then the third thing is we think that there needs to be um, a real attention to the design of the organization, not as a design that is rigid, as Chris pointed out, but it is a design that is very flexible and that organizations can use as a tool to adjust and to adapt in a very flexible and agile manner. And I, don't, I think it's not, um, it's not a surprise that we're talking this way, uh, given that Chris and, and Ed Lawler and others have um, carried out uh, a really significant set of work on what makes an organization agile and these agile capabilities that Chris and I are talking about is uh, definitely a piece of that. Um, so I, Chris mentioned that there are certain routines that have to be built into an organization. By routine, it's something that can happen over and over again that the organization really knows how to do. So many of you have gone through um, a process of introducing routines to deal with customer failures. What happens when you fail with a customer and how do you recover? That's a routine you build in, and once people learn it, then it's part of the fabric of the organization. We believe the same thing is true about change capabilities and design capabilities. There have to be certain routines that are built into the organization. Um, so the, uh, let me just give a few of these. I won't read through this, but this deck is available to you as a resource. Uh, one is an established design framework and process. The people in the organization need to know what does organization design mean and how do we do it and what are the elements of it and what are the options. We can do little designs. We can do big designs. We have teams that we pull together. You'll see that, you know, this creating of teams to do it uh, for different kinds of designs. We can create the lateral connections around change when change involves multiple parts of the organization. We can get our line leaders to understand that part of their responsibility is to make sure that they're designed to use their resources efficiently. Make that part of how they're reviewed. Make that part of the tools that get provided for line managers. Make that part of their yearly goal setting is do we have to do any uh, readjustment in our design in order to address the, the, the uh, many strategic challenges that we're facing. Uh, develop mechanism for extended input to designs and change. One of our, our sponsors, Avery Dennison, has this wonderful process where um, they've got, through the organization, over 600 people that are, are called ambassadors that, that they reach out to and, and, and ask questions and get input about the changes the organization is going through. And they rely on that input to make the adjustments that are required to continually adapt and change the, uh, the, um, uh, the way in which resources are connected in the organization to address the, the strategic challenges. 
and then um, uh, that the, the languages and shared models of organization are really critical, and they have to extend well beyond your organization design and development people. They have to become part of the fabric of the organization, in our view. And, and we can't have a, a flavor of the month with different, um, different uh, consultants, internal or external, bringing different languages and ways of thinking about this. Um, the routines of implementing and learning, again, I'm not going to go through them all, but the change management frameworks that have to be simple and flexible and then elaborated or simplified to meet the, the change at hand. Um, and people need to know what those are and how you implement changes. There has to be processes for learning from experience, whether that's a test and learn process, um, whether that's an com uh, 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 organizational community of practice issue, um, whether it's a lessons learned, systematic lessons learned process, um, and then there have to be mechanisms to create shared meaning. One of the most important ones, we think, is for there to be very clear and generally understood um, uh, understanding of the, of the strategy and the various kinds of, of um, uh, commonalities and differences that are going to exist in the organization and how the organization is thinking about its different markets and where it's trying to grow and what its value is that it's, that it's trying to add in the marketplace. But those, that really sharing that is part of the design process because without that, uh, design can't occur effectively. Um, so on this, this uh, model, which again, um, I just want to talk about to make a point, these are the uh, six processes that we see in any kind of ongoing redesign are going on simultaneously in the organization. One has to do with the strategy and the business case and the criteria for organizational effectiveness. And really getting that understood and evolving that and communicating it and having it guide the decisions of the organization. Another is the macro design changes. That, that many of us think of org design as these macro design changes. We're changing from a functional to a product organization, or we're changing from a domestic and geographically constrained organization to a global organization. But in addition to that, there are all kinds of sub-pieces of that, as Chris pointed out in his um, a continuous change model, and there's all kinds of micro design that has occurred, local tailoring. What we're doing in China doesn't fit with what we're doing in India, with what we're doing in uh, the South, South Pacific area, or what we're doing in Japan, or what we're doing in South America. Um, and those need, we need to have the capability to help those different regions um, to adapt the overall strategy of the company, understand their piece in it, and design their resources effectively. Uh, the learning piece, there's a her tremendous amount of learning involved in most of the changes that companies are having to do, and that involves something other than taking people to a classroom and training them, something other than one-way communication and, and playbooks that are rolled out into the organization. It, revolves, it involves a tremendous amount of two-way conversations and inner team development and learning by doing and iterating. Um, Training and development is a piece of it because, to be sure, especially with the technology changes, there's a lot of just plain technical skills and uh, process and soft skills that have to be involved. And then the only way to know um, that change is, is required is through that, that change model that we share that involves assessing and, 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 and really being aware of what's going on in the world and making changes and understanding how they fit with changes that are being made elsewhere. So this implementation assessment piece is really critical. Now, if you look at that, you can say, yeah, we know all those pieces, and we sometimes do them. But what Chris and I really have learned is if they aren't all going on, and if you don't have a group of, of resources that are able to make sure that these things are occurring and make sure that they're occurring effectively, and figure out how they all fit together so that the changes aren't working across purposes, that our belief is you're not going to have enough internal agility to respond to what's going on in the world. This is a very different set of requirements for the designing and organizational effectiveness component of the, of the company or, or capability in the company. Uh, this is a picture simply of 
it's a high level picture that you've got an executive steering team of some sort that's looking at all the change in the organization. You've got a bunch of business leaders who have to become involved in saying what changes do we need to address our 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 world and then you've got on the right the change management transition team members, the people that have design and change capabilities, that have process development capabilities, that that have um, communication capabilities, that have team development capabilities and so forth, that are almost like um, on-call capabilities that are working within a, an overarching framework and dealing with all the many, many changes that are going on and uh, uh, can coordinate with each other. Uh, that is a framework we don't see. That The framework on the right is a framework we don't see well-developed in most of the companies that we're dealing with. Um, so what does that mean? It means that to develop the capability for organization design to become an agile capability in the organization, we need to get the talent and the knowledge, and then we need to create the, the, the positioning of that talent so it actually can operate effectively. Uh, we need processes to quickly assess the talent of the organization. Uh, we need to know what this new talent is. We need to be able to plan and staff and have the processes and principles to, con to quickly assemble this talent around the needs of the organization. We need to develop career progression frameworks and principles for people who have this talent. And we need pl flexible processes for quickly identifying the issues and opportunities and combining the knowledge with the other knowledge in the organization to quickly create solutions to the challenges that the organization is facing. We don't believe that year and a half change processes are fast enough in today's environment. These really have to be agile capabilities. Um, we, it, this is what we think design capability looks like. I'm not going to go through the details, but you'll notice that at the center, the bullseye is business understanding. This capability needs to be so closely related to your business leaders, that it is continually responding to the business needs that are coming up. It is bringing principles, models, frameworks. It is bringing experience and the contingency understanding and examples for learning for the various parts of the organization. It is bringing the ability and the outside to di continue to diagnose, design, have the relational skills to be influential, um, the project management implementation skills, and the legitimacy, it has to be positioned for success. It cannot be buried in the organization because this group is continually, it's the nerve response to, wow, something's going on where we have to adjust and we have to have a direct line to the business leaders to get some sort of attention to this and resourcing of the changes. We can't wait for the next budget cycle to apply resources to a problem that's happening in India that we're going to lose 30% of our market share if we don't respond right now. We have to have the capability to respond to that kind of thing. Uh, so we think, and we have an article that is, is, is cited here that, that, that many of you have already received um, uh, in earlier communications that talks about the new set of organizational effectiveness capabilities to which design is the central piece in our view. And it has to do with the engage and learn model of change creating awareness. We believe that the OE organization is responsible for making sure that there is an awareness system in the organization of what's going on and what it has to be adapted to. Um, it has to be able to, to catalyze the reflecting and, 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 and learning that about the environmental changes that are necessary to plan a course of action to respond. Um, we have to work to understand the strengths and, and weaknesses uh, uh, of the organization and has to be able to initiate the design changes that are required to address and, and, uh, and to learn about um, the changes that are required. It has to be able to tailor. You need to have organization design people who can realize that we just came up with a design that's going to work great in the developed world, but it's not going to work at all in Africa. So we're going to have to have somebody down there who can, um, uh, can, can adjust um, what we've come up with so it fits within the context of Africa, for, uh, just as an example. And it has to be able to monitor and figure out when the change is causing chaos and when it needs um, to be refined and when and it, the organization needs to learn and iterate the changes. 
and it has to be able to detect patterns really quickly in the diagnostic um, data that's occurring in the organization and it has to have enough influence and direct contact to line managers to be able to initiate those kinds of changes. Um, we don't believe that that competency is in place in, organ in organizations, most organizations today. We see organizations among which are 13 companies or some where that is really being enhanced, but we don't think that organizations tend to think about it this way. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, what you can see is the, the challenge of developing um, these design capabilities and um, uh, it, it, it's, it's fairly daunting. It's embedded models and frameworks. It's, we believe this is a deep expertise. This is not just a question of taking your business partners and sending them to a two-day workshop. This is a, a deep set of expertise. It's experience-based. It's practicum-based. Um, it's development through, through communities of practice. It's ongoing nurturing and sharing. It's getting line managers and clients to understand it as a discipline that, that uh, contributes value to the organization. Um, and it is, um, uh, involves collaboration and teaming with all the other change-oriented capabilities, such as process expertise, talent development. And one of the major ones is strategy, connecting this capability to strategy. I'm sorry, I went one too fast. Um, so what, mostly what we see with our 13 companies is an attempt to do two things. One is make sure there's many people in the organization who have an awareness of organization design and why it's important. This is HR, this is line manager, this is strategy, this is functional leaders who understand that this process is going on and then it's getting some cadre of professionals with deep knowledge of organizational effectiveness, of design and implementation, and getting them really closely connected to the business so that they really can register what the, the challenges are that are being faced. They need to be able to lead and manage, as we said, small and large design projects. They need to be able to partner with external consultants that they have to bring in as extenders, not bring the external consultants in to solve the problems and set up big initiatives necessarily, although sometimes that's required, but when that happens, to really partner with them. Uh, stay closely linked to the line leaders and to strategy and, part and create teams. We, we see many organizations where all the different change-oriented groups, communication, process development, Six Sigma, um, OE, change management, leadership development, um, are completely disconnected, when, when, uh, which doesn't work when you need to have this kind of flexible adaptation. So the, be, the ability to build a routine in the organization of creating cross-functional change support teams is really critical to all this. So where should this design expertise reside? That's, that's a big question, I think. Um, the, we've seen two options. One is create a center of excellence. And by the way, it doesn't need to be attached to HR. It could be attached to strategy. It could be in the COO office. The most effective design capability that I've ever seen was um, in, in Hewlett Packard in a, a period of time ago when the whole design organization was in the office of the COO and was in support of creating an effective operating organization. HR partnered with the design office, strategy partnered with it, but it was in support of the operating organization. It read the huge amount of flexibility in organization design because it was so closely connected to the, to the business. That's not a necessity, but the, it is a necessity, as you'll see in the three bullets, that consultants in this capability need to be connected to the businesses. And that there may be some deep experts that are corporate assets such as, let's say, people who consult the strategy development, and they may be assigned to projects on the basis of strategic need, but that there needs to be really a perception in the organization that these folk enable business effectiveness. And those consultants have to be deployed to lead and partner with business sponsors of major initiatives, 
It can't be buried in the organization where it's called in by, when, when, when the organization finally realizes it needs it. It needs to be, from the beginning, built into every change initiative. Option two is to decentralize this capability, put it into the business units, and have it be really, really responsible to the business units, either through HR or strategy or more likely by reporting to the head of the business as a capability that helps the head of the business continually align resources, the organization. Um, we, we've sort of, over the 10 years, become pretty skeptical that this can be buried within HR if it's going to have this kind of an impact, although we do believe that if it reports to the CHRO, it can be partnered really effectively with the COO or with strategy. Um, in any case, if it is decentralized to the business units, there needs to be a really strong community of practice that is coming up with continual improvements. In HP, they called it IP, the IP of change and design. The, the tools, the knowledge, the models, the frameworks that can help businesses to adapt to the changes that they're facing. So um, the barriers that we've seen, insufficient depth of knowledge and experience, I think all the companies that we're dealing with are saying, we don't have enough deep knowledge in org design. And we think partially that's because it's been buried in HR. Buried is the key word there, not in HR. It could be in HR, but not buried. And it's reporting to business leaders who have become talent leaders. And they see the OE people in the organization, I've heard this over and over, as really key contributors who aren't yet ready to be our business partners. If, if I, our belief is that if we don't start to see this talent as its own discipline that needs to partner with the talent, that needs to partner with strategy, but needs to have a direct link to the business logic, that th this, this capability will not be developed. Uh, we see a lot of the design capability organizations having insufficient access to clients, partly because the business partners are positioned as the gatekeepers for this talent. We see some organizations where the business partners are expected to be the design consultants in addition to their job, which already is 150% of their time. We see design experts getting captured in business units that underutilize them. They get frustrated and they leave. And then organizations say, we train these folk and then we can't keep them. We see line leaders who have lost the faith that, that HR and or the organization in general can provide them with the design support they need, and they go straight to consultants rather than internally through people in, internal. And we, we have found out, because of the many, many requests we get, that design experts are highly marketable, and if they don't feel that they're getting experience and or have the access to really do meaningful work, that they will leave, and then the business leaders will develop a, a sense that, that, um, the, the, or, that the organization can't provide them with this and they need to continually have these big initiatives and bring in external folk rather than do the ongoing kinds of things that are required to continually adapt. So um, what we have uh, done in our CEO work, I think, addresses um, what, what can be done in terms of training and development, which is, is you know, just one piece of it, as we pointed out. Um, but I think this is what organizations are thinking about. One is the framework knowledge of organization design needs to be um, available to people and needs to be understood by a, a fairly large a group of people in the organization. Another is uh, there needs to be people who have developed deep skills through practicums. And a third is that there needs to be a, a new understanding of how design and change and ongoing change fit in. And we need to put those frameworks, those friends that Chris talked about, uh, the ADCAR and the Lewinian models of change, we need to put them in the framework of this new context of continuous change and continuous redesign. So I'm sorry, we have gone too long. We're happy to stay on the line if there are questions that you want to bring up. 
Um, Chris, do you have anything that you would like to add um, uh, as a comment, as a, a set of comments, closing um, comments? Yeah, no, I've, I've been uh, I've been responding to some of the questions and comments that have been coming in the chat while uh, while you were talking. So a couple of things I think showed up there, which was really good, is is to think that, and I, you talked about there's multiple ways to do this, and um, you and I always resist kind of you know what's the right best way. It's always a you know it's going to have to depend on the strategy and the industry and the situation, and but there are multiple ways. And those multiple ways get played out by the points of the star. Uh, that's the things that support it. I think another really good uh, comment that was made was um, there's going to be this cadre of people who have new ideas and can introduce new ideas, and that those new ideas are going to have to get um, uh, have to compete with traditional perspectives about this is the way we've always done things. And, and I liken it to the to the ambidexterity. You have to exploit on the one hand, and you have to explore on the other. And those are two very different um, capabilities in themselves. And and there, there's tension between them, which requires leadership, requires solid people, requires good processes to manage that tension. So I think a lot of the comments have been really good, and I've I, hopefully I've made the, some comments along the way in the, in the chat room to to help people out to, on some of these ideas. But, uh, you know, uh, if I had to say there was one thing, I'd say that barrier slide that you showed, man, that, that's, that's, that's the hard, those are the hard won lessons of the work that we've been doing with organizations. Yeah, and I, and I would add to that the barriers and then the need to get awareness of this, connection to line managers, the need to get practicum-based experience and sharing, and then the need really to have a different understanding of change. Those those three things to me yeah. are, you know, where where Chris and I are putting yes. our efforts because that's yeah. where we're seeing companies express their need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the risk the risk is if they don't do it well, then a couple of these points the design experts leave. They do. Yep. Because they are very marketable. Yep. And they, and they ironically, uh, most of them are going out and becoming private consultants. Which isn't bad. The problem is every time you bring in external consultants, they need to learn your business, which yeah. is why you need the internal partners to work really closely with them. Mm-hmm. Yep. See, any other thoughts people have? Happy to... Uh... Yeah. To, uh, and and we'll, we are continuing to evolve our offerings as CEO to support this. Our, uh, for co our corporate sponsors, we're always happy to have conversations. In fact, we'll be setting up a dialogue around how do you build design capabilities. Um, and please let us know your interests and reach out to us with questions or thoughts. We, we think that of this as a work in progress. For sure, for sure. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sue and Chris, for a great webinar. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Carrie, for your help. Bye.